Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today we'll be talking remotely again with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon who practices orthopedic surgery in Ashtabula, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Seeds. Thanks for having me, Randy. Dr. Seeds, what I thought we would cover today uh, in our, our discussion is a relatively new um, procedure that orthopedists have begun doing over the last, uh, I would say, 10 years, uh, and that's hip arthroscopy. You know, I think that arthroscopy has been around with, with other joints, the knee and the shoulder most, most commonly, uh, for years and years and years, probably going on 30 to 40 years uh, when it's, it's been in common utilization. But hip arthroscopy is something new. I think that the hip is a, a joint that's very deep in the body, so it's, it's more difficult to get the scope into the right place. And, and of course, that joint's pretty tight compared to the knee and the shoulder. And, and having the room to work in that joint is very difficult. But still, we're starting to see more and more utilization uh, of hip arthroscopy uh, for both diagnosis and treatment of, of different hip diseases. So I thought today what we would do is sort of give people an understanding of, of what happens when uh, a surgeon recommends hip arthroscopy, what's the rationale for uh, recommending hip arthroscopy, and, and give us some ideas of, of where the technology is these days. What can you accomplish with a hip arth arthroscope uh, in, in treating problems? So let's begin by talking a little bit of, in, in general terms about hip arthroscopy. Why is it different than these other joints other than it's just a little more difficult? Well, I think, Randy, I, I think definitely the changes that have occurred in, in the technology of, uh, of the hip arthroscopy, I've, I've actually been doing hip arthroscopies for about the last 13 to 13 or so years in my practice, and I've seen a lot of changes with the equipment and in how we approach the hip and, and as far as the, um, the actual the actual changes that we can make now with different devices that we use as, as far as in treatment and, and protocols for the problems we find with, with the hip and using the hip arthroscopy. I think there's definitely been um, a better awareness and understanding as more people are getting involved in the research of, of these hip problems and, and the techniques of entering the hip have changed somewhat from where we first started. And I think that has definitely made it made it a, an easier process. Um, I think what's what's important to understand with the hip arthroscopy opposed to other arthroscopies that we do in the shoulder and elbow and uh, the knee basically are that with the hip arthroscopy, the one of the most important factors in that hip arthroscopy is being able to distract that hip the the ball and socket so that we can get our instrumentation in the hip joint. And I think initially that's where a, a lot of the uh, hesitation in, in getting into hip arthroscopy started because it, we had limited uses of devices of being able to distract that hip joint. And in the, in the beginnings we used to use, uh, we, and some of us still do, we used the uh, fracture table to distract the hip joint. And it's the, it was getting the the science behind how long could you distract that hip joint, how many pounds of distraction could you put on the hip. Um, those are the kind of the initial early questions that we had to work through and, and get comfortable with and how much do you distract that hip uh, were, were important issues that we were all trying to get a better understanding of. And I, I think that we've come a long way in the last 15 years uh, in understanding that and in, in treating the disease and, and what we can do in, in uh, helping patients where you know a minimal approach is is definitely something where we can help people now uh, where in the past we didn't have this ability to. Now in terms of the procedure itself um, I'm assuming that hip arthroscopy is an outpatient procedure like other forms of arthroscopy is that accurate? Yes it's a it's a same-day surgery and uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, that that basically is uh, treated the same way as we do with our knee and shoulder arthroscopies, et cetera. So describe for me a little bit about how hip arthroscopy is done. Do you always put, put patients to sleep to do hip arthroscopy? Can this be done under a spinal type anesthetic? Sort of questions like how long does it take and, and how many different little holes do you make in the hip, what we would call portals, to actually see inside the hip and uh, do the work that you need to do. 
Yes, I, I would say that for, for of all of our arthroscopies, the hip arthroscopy, the actual setup is the, is the most involved setup we have of any of our, our type of cases and actually take a, a more of a significant period of time to, to get the patient uh, positioned on the table properly and in the traction device properly uh, to, in combination, we're using an x-ray machine as opposed to a knee or shoulder arthroscopy or elbow, we typically don't use a fluoroscopy unit, which is an x-ray machine in conjunction with, with doing our arthroscopy. So you, you've got a lot of equipment in a room at one time that you know you need to, things need to flow and, and flow appropriately. So the, the initial setup, once you've got that down, uh, can help significantly. And we've seen that change over the years um, in, in how we're able to, to get that done. As far as how I approach, I usually put my patients to sleep. I don't do spinals, I, I put them to sleep. Initially, I started with spinals. Uh, I've gone more to just putting the patient to sleep. Uh, and the time frame I usually gauge is between one hour to 90 minutes uh, as far as what I like to see is for, for the distraction of the hip joint and, and what I like to accomplish arthroscopically. Um, I would say I can usually keep that within that hour time frame, and that's one important thing that we keep track of is how long is that hip joint distracted uh, during the surgery. As far as the portals go, it depends on the type of hip arthroscopy, you're, you know what you're trying to accomplish, but usually it's it's between two to three up to four portals around the hip joint, and uh, pretty much like possibly a shoulder, um, and uh, that's really the, the how things have progressed over time. There are more portals that are that have been access, accessed uh, for different problems, but that's continuing to change. Now, you, you had mentioned that uh, you like to keep the traction below one hour. I guess a lot of patients are going to ask, what what happens after an hour? I mean, uh, what is the problem with keeping the hip in traction? What are you trying to prevent? Well, I think there have been a couple of issues that we, we're concerned with is one, when you're distracting the hip out of the joint space, it's a reduction in blood flow to that hip joint uh, just with the traction itself. It's the potential of a nerve injury um, to, the, uh, to the nerves around the hip joint. Uh, I think those are two, two of the more specific things that, uh, that we look, you know, that we're paying attention to during that process. And as you finish uh, your procedure in terms of, of the post-operative care, you, you mentioned that this is an outpatient procedure. Is the patient going to be on crutches? Uh, do you let them weight bear immediately after this procedure? Or, or how do you stand on that? Yes, well, I, I think we, we're definitely, it's, it's a protective weight bearing because we have, uh, in distracting that hip and entering the hip joint, we have definitely altered the I, some of the mechanical receptors and proprioception to that hip joint where, where they're not in complete control of that hip initially. And if we've done any work around the labrum or the cartilage, we certainly want to protect the, the work that we've done. But I do find that, um, that the, the mechanics of the hip joint are definitely changed uh, for that patient in that first acute period of time. And in fact, on all my hip arthroscopies, I start physical therapy immediately the next day because I, I think that that acute intervention with getting the therapist involved and getting that patient um, more mechanically involved with their hip helps them significantly in starting to develop you know that normal process of the proprioception and what we call the mechanoreceptors in the hip of getting that uh, that neurological part back in gear I think I'd like to say. Well, you know, we mentioned that, that hip arthroscopy can help us to see what's going on inside the hip, and we can make a, a much more accurate diagnosis and, and rule out certain things and rule in certain things. But what's the rationale for doing hip arthroscopy? When, when you go in and try to actually use hip arthroscopy as a surgical tool, what are you trying to accomplish inside the hip? What sort of conditions are amenable to treating with hip arthroscopy? Well, I, I think the most common use that I have in my practice is in that younger patient that presents with possibly some early degenerative changes in the hip, uh, 
where there may be a more of a degenerative type of labral injury or a small articular injury or a loose body within that hip joint. And my objective is to get in there, clean up that tear, remove that loose body or clean up that cartilage injury where I can contain that problem and potentially increase that longevity of the joint um, with removing those mechanical impingement factors. I, and I, I would probably tell you that that, that, that process of, of what I'm trying to accomplish is to improve the mechanics of that hip because most of those patients are presenting with some type of impingement uh, or restrictive motion type of problem that's isolated specifically to, to what I just indicated as far as labral, cartilage, or loose body. You know, and sometimes, you know, we see a, a, a synovitis or a, a, a ligamentum teres type of inflammation. Sometimes we'll see those. That's the attachment to the head of the, uh, of the uh, femur. Um, so those type of things, I, I think we can be, we're, we're very good at assisting where in the past, uh, you know, we didn't have that opportunity. We, we'd have to open up the hip joint to get down to that labrum or get that loose body out of the hip. Yeah, I think we should point out that, you know, as, as much as hip arthroscopy seems to be somewhat of a, a big operation where you distract the hip, you pull the hip out so you can get inside the hip joint, in the old days, we had to completely dislocate the hip. We opened the joint capsule, we d damaged the blood flow into the hip joint, into the femoral head, and a relatively minor operation, uh, such as you've just pointed out, just going in after a little bone chip or something like that, did so much damage to normal tissue that, that surgeons were very, very uh, loath to, to actually do hip surgery that did not involve replacing the hip uh, because of that need to dislocate the hip. Arthroscopy has given us the ability to look inside the hip now without doing all that damage. So I think it's a huge advance that patients who've never uh, sort of thought about that probably don't understand. But, but it, it was a, a huge endeavor to operate inside the hip uh, with a lot of damage and destruction uh, that didn't need to occur. And I think hip arthroscopy has uh, r r changed that for, for the better for the most part. W would you agree? Absolutely, Randy. It's, it's, it's a nice tool and, and treatment protocol to be able to use for some of those problems that we had just discussed. You know, I do think we ought to give patients a better understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about terms like uh, the labrum of the hip. Uh, can you go into the, to the labrum and the labral tear and give us a little more detail about what the hip labrum does and, and what a hip labral tear really is? Yes, the, the labrum of the hip is, is pretty much the cushion around what we call the acetabulum or the cup of the hip. It's very similar to the meniscus in the shoulder or the labrum in, or the meniscus in the knee or the labrum in the shoulder. And it acts as a, also a stabilizer around the hip joint and a protective uh, cushion for the cartilage. And the tears that we seem to, that, that I seem to see more commonly in my practice are tears that are more what I would call um, superior posterior lateral around that acetabulum more in the superior back part of the cup um, some are there are some more anterior but most of them I see in, in that in that quadrant of the hip joint where there can be small tears that have torn from some rotational problem or some hip flexion problem or I see more in my practice more degenerative type of tears as I would refer to them where the labrum is just worn over time because of some cartilage loss and some increased wear of, of that cushion. Yeah, and I think we ought to also point out to patients that in the old days we had very little treatment for that. We either waited till it got to the point where you needed an artificial hip or we didn't treat it and just uh, treated the patient with uh, anti-inflammatory medications and told them to sort of put up with it. So a lot of patients put up with pain for you know several years before they really felt like that uh, they needed an artificial hip. This has changed that treatment to some degree as we now have treatments that can actually reduce the symptoms and uh, we may not change the, the, the end result. That patient may still go on to have more wear and tear and actually end up with an artificial hip. But we've got some treatments that actually make the time period as that process is occurring uh, probably much more uh, pleasant to some degree. 
Um, so I think that's good information. We, we probably ought to talk a little bit about complications and recovery from, from hip arthroscopy. You mentioned that you went ahead and started physical therapy fairly quickly. How long do you think it takes for a patient to recover after hip arthroscopy to the point to where they can go back to their normal activity? Well, Randy, we, we typically shoot for, I, I found that hip arthroscopy patients sometimes can be very difficult patients in the post-op process to take care of because some of, if there have been true mechanical problems, say a loose body or a, a small labral tear and you've taken care of that, some of these patients within the first day or two immediately feel, you know, that they're completely healed and have significant improvement and can just go about their way uh, without necess necessitating any further intervention with the therapist. Um, I try to encourage with them that, you know, by me entering the hip and some of the work that I've done, I have changed some of the mechanics of that hip joint somewhat, and there's more of a, I feel there is more of an increased laxity, and, and we do know that that, that, is a, that, that that's a process, you know, that, that's involved with, with the arthroscopy of the hip, and it's important that the patients understand that because sometimes they can get into more trouble down the road. Um, if they don't understand that and follow that process. So I, I kind of like to give them a six week time frame of where I, I, in the first week I do some early protective weight bearing. I start to, I want them to get again that familiar process of the proprioception, understanding their hip joint and the muscle function to get that back and then help them through the process of the hip strengthening and, and and I really do focus on that six weeks because I, I think that's a time frame that's reasonable. Um, if there's any type of repair involved in the hip of a labral repair, well, that's going to change that process. In, in my practice, I, I, I don't see labral repairs as, as, as maybe some other people may uh, be more involved with. Um, so that in my practice is very limited. And, and if that's part of the process, that can change that to more to the three to four month process. But in most instances, it's about six weeks. Well, let's talk a little bit about complications. What do you as a surgeon worry about uh, either during hip arthroscopy or in the post-operative uh, uh, phase of recovery from hip arthroscopy? What are the complications that you worry about? Well, it, you know, initially with the, the things that we look for are any type of a nerve injury that could occur from the traction of, of the surgery or sometimes the fluid that can build up around the hip joint can cause uh, you know a neuropraxia or a, a temporary nerve problem. We certainly are always uh, we, we want to be aware of any potential vessel um, you know blood vessel problem where you could have some increased bleeding and those are some initial things that you look for uh, that are easily followed with with the uh, post-operative uh, follow-up and of course any type of infection um, you know the potential for a post-op infection are, are some of the initial things that we look for also with the fact that we're distracting the hip joint um, it, it, we're also cognizant of being careful in evaluating that patient for any potential development in uh, in blood clots of that extremity so those are some of the initial things that we're keeping an eye on uh, and, and trying to do things post-operatively to prevent that. And that's another reason with the therapy that we like to get that limb in movement motion that will assist in, all, in, in evaluating all of those things also post-operatively. So as the patient goes down the road and, and, and continues to, to progress in their rehabilitation, any other things you're worried about down the road in terms of complications uh, of hip arthroscopy? Well, I, I certainly, what I don't want to see is that we're accelerating the problem. And, and I think that's, that's been a concern with, with hip arthroscopy as far as if you have patients that have some early degenerative changes and they have a degenerative labral tear, you go in, you clean it up, you make their hip better. You know, we're, 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 we don't want to see the, an acceleration of that disease process in the hip joint. I don't think we're seeing that in our practice. That's certainly a worry that you have with, with these procedures. Uh, the other is instability of that hip joint. Are we creating more of a, an instability to accelerate those problems? Um, those are some current issues that I think are up for debate uh, presently. 
but I, I would tell you that initially in, in, in my practice of where I've, as I've indicated, I see more degenerative problems or mechanical symptoms, I'd say over the last 13 years that I, I think we've done a good job and I think that the literature will, will, will bear this out and has bear, bear this out that there are improvements that we can help patients with in improving their quality of life and possibly increasing that, that longevity of the joint. Well, you know, this is a new procedure, and I think that, that we're all still trying to decide what the role of arthroscopy is in hip disease. And I think you pointed out some of those questions that uh, still exist in terms of, of, of what's the long-term uh, effects of hip arthroscopy. I think this has been an excellent discussion in terms of giving the patient um, some idea of what's possible, uh, some idea of what to expect from hip arthroscopy. Do you have any other comments that we haven't covered, areas of concern that you may have, or perhaps some predictions for the future about hip arthroscopy that you would like to, to express to patients before we close? Well, I think as you've indicated, the, uh, the literature and research that's being done around the hip with, uh, with all over the world right now is, is exploding, and I think we're learning a lot more about more symptoms and presentations of syndromes such as you know femoral, femoral acetabular uh, symptoms and so to speak things that we look for now and it's it'll be interesting to see how this progresses with the improvement for uh, for treatment uh, for these problems so I think it's it's absolutely a, a great tool to have in treating some early problems in the hip joint, and I'm excited to see where the technology takes us in the future. Well, well, thank you for those comments, and I think we ought to point out to patients that you know hip arthroscopy is is something that uh, uh, not all orthopedic surgeons do, and it's it's still difficult to find uh, an orthopedic surgeon who does the procedure, and it's it's more difficult to find uh, an orthopedic surgeon with a significant experience in this procedure. So I think we're very early on, and I, I would encourage patients to, you know, to at least if they have a hip problem that they think arthroscopy is appropriate for, they may have to look a little harder to find someone who's really skilled at doing this, and they should probably uh, uh, look around uh, uh, before they, they choose a, a hip procedure or choose some sort of a, a treatment regimen that uh, may not include uh, hip arthroscopy if it's appropriate for them. So I think they're going to have to look a little harder to find an orthopedic surgeon that's, uh, that, that's comfortable doing this procedure. Um, uh, that's been my experience anyway. I'm not certain if you have any last minute comments on that. I, I absolutely agree. I've been fortunate enough to, to have been involved in hip arthroscopy early on in my in my training and was able to carry this forward, as I've said, to, uh, where I, I believe it's become an integral part of my practice probably the last 13 years and growing. Um, and uh, we'll see where it continues to go. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Look forward to, to some more discussions in the future. So thank you. Thanks, Randy.